someone to please take that front seat for us so it's not empty for the camera? It looks very bad on camera. Who wants to be a hero? Who wants to get their face on television? gentlemen, welcome to Toronto, Canada, to Roy Thompson Hall for the Monk Debate on China. My name is Rudyard Griffiths. I'm the co-organizer of these Monk Debates with my colleague Patrick Luciani, and it is my privilege to once again be your moderator this evening. I want to welcome first the thousands of people watching this debate online, live on the internet right now on theglobeandmail.com and monkdebates.com. It's terrific to have you as part of tonight's proceedings. A warm hello also to the millions of people watching, reading, and listening to this debate, everywhere from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation down under, to C-SPAN throughout the United States, to the People's Daily in China, and through our international media partnership with the Financial Times of London and its prestigious China Confidential Research Unit. Hello, too, to Canadians coast to coast who are listening and watching everywhere from CBC Radio Ideas uh, to CPAC, our own national public affairs channel, and on the network where I host a daily television show, BNN. It's great to have you as part of this debate, too. And finally, if I look around this hall filled to capacity, 2,700 people who have come out for a second time in a row for these monk debates here at Roy Thompson Hall. All of us associated with this project, just thank you for your support 
for the simple idea to which this series is dedicated, and that's to create venues like this where we can gather together as citizens to debate the big geopolitical issues that are changing Canada and changing the world. The success of this series, its ability to bring to Toronto some of the world's sharpest thinkers, brightest minds, would not be possible without the philanthropic creativity and generosity of two individuals. I'd like all of us here tonight to join me in a round of applause for our hosts, the co-founders of the Monk Debates, Peter and Melanie Monk. Bravo, you two. We're going to keep at this. Now, for the moment, we have all been waiting for, we have our motion before us. Be it resolved, the 21st century will belong to China. All we need now is our debaters' center stage. Let's have a big round of applause for the two debaters who will be arguing for the motion, Neil Ferguson and David Lee. Now, let's welcome their formidable opponents onto the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Fareed Zakaria and Dr. Henry Kissinger. Well, to introduce our debaters, Neil Ferguson is well known to Monk debate members. In our first debate, our very first debate in 2008, he and Charles Krauthammer bested now National Security Council member Samantha Power and the late Richard Holbrook on the motion, be it resolved, the world is a safer place with a Republican in the White House. That was a very spirited debate, Neil, and you did well. Since 2008, Neil Ferguson has uh, added to his raft of internationally best-selling books with the publication of The Ascent of Money, and most important to us tonight, Civilization, The Rest and the West. He holds a variety of prestigious professorships and lectureships everywhere from Oxford to Harvard to LSE. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Ferguson. Now, our next debater joins us directly from Beijing, China, where he is the director of the Center for China in the World Economy at the University School of Economics and Management in Beijing. In many ways, his personal biography mirrors China's rise. His family was displaced by the Cultural Revolution. David still has memories of this as a four-year-old boy. 28 years later, he received his PhD from Harvard. He is now one of only three academic members of the Monetary Policy Advisory Committee of the Central Bank of China. And one indication of the key role that he plays representing a new generation of thought leadership in China is this. David, an economist, get ready for this, has three million plus followers on the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. <laughs> Move over Justin Bieber. <laughs> Now, Fried Zakaria is a familiar face to Canadians. He's the host and the driving force behind CNN's flagship international affairs program, Fried Zakaria GPS. You have also read him at Time Magazine, where he's editor-at-large, and in the Washington Post. He's the author of the internationally acclaimed books, The Future of Freedom, and the recently updated Post-American World Release 2.0. As you will hear tonight, Fareed is one of the most thoughtful and provocative U.S. thinkers practicing today on America's role in the world and the effect of the rising powers. Fareed Zakaria, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. 
Now, our final debater. He has played a central role in global affairs for the last half century. His public service has been rightly honored by the Nobel Peace Prize and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Most important to us, though, he is the single individual, arguably, here today internationally, who can interpret China's rise, given his unique contribution to bringing China back into the community of nations after its cultural revolution. And tonight, he makes history again, participating in his very first public debate on China or any other subject. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Monk Debates the 56th Secretary of State of the United States, Dr. Henry Kissinger. So, before I let our debaters at each other, let's briefly run through how the next hour and a half will unfold. Each of our debaters will have six minutes for their opening statements to make their case for and against this motion. And talking of timing, there's going to be a clock on the screen as we've done in the past. When you see it count down to zero, join me in a round of applause for the debater speaking, and that will ensure that we continue this debate in a timely fashion. After uh, those opening statements, we're going to have our debaters cross-examine each other's views and opinions, and then we're going to bring you, the audience, into the conversation through three ways. We have some notable people, some interesting people in the audience tonight who I'll call on. We have students from the Monk School of Global Affairs here also. And finally, we have a raft of questions from our own website, Facebook, and Twitter, which I will weave into the conversation. So let's see, how did this audience vote coming into this evening when it was a question of, did you believe the 21st century will belong to China? Let's take a look at those numbers up on the screen. This is the pre-audience vote. Interesting. 39% of you <laughs> believe, yes, this century could be owned by China. 21% do not know, so there's a swing vote in play already. <laughs> Next question, we asked, would you be open to changing your mind depending on what you heard over the course of the debate, changing your vote? Let's have those results, please, just to drill down into that undecided <laughs> vote. Wow! Look at that. Ladies and gentlemen, we officially have a debate on our hands. Well. To get us started, as has been previously agreed, I'm going to call on Neil Ferguson. You have six minutes for your opening statement, sir. Well, thank you, Roger, and ladies and gentlemen. I believe the 21st century will belong to China because most centuries have belonged to China. <laughs> the 19th and 20th centuries were the exception. 18 of the last uh, 20 centuries saw China as by some margin, the largest economy in the world. Now, let me begin uh, with some demographics and economics. China is more a continent than a country. A fifth of humanity uh, lives there. It's 40 times the size of Canada, folks. If China were organized like Europe, it would, be have, it would have to be divided up into 90 nation states. Today, there are 11 cities in China with a population of more than 6 million. There's only one in Europe, and that's London. There are 11 European Union states with populations of less than 6 million. In just 30 years, China's economy has grown by a factor of very, very nearly 10. And the IMF recently projected that it will be the largest economy in the world in just five years' time. It's already overtaking the United States as a manufacturer and as the world's biggest automobile market. And the demand for cars in China will increase by tenfold in the years to come. By 2035, China will be using one-fifth of all global 
energy. It used to be reliant on foreign direct investment. Today, with $3 trillion of international reserves and a sovereign wealth fund with $200 billion of assets, China is the investor. And what's perhaps most impressive is that China is catching up in terms of innovation and in terms of education. It's about to overtake Germany in terms of new patents granted. And in a recent OECD survey of educational attainment at the age of 15, the region of Shanghai came top in mathematical attainment with a score of 600. The United States came 25th with 487. You'll be glad to hear that, China, uh, that Canada got 527. Better, better, but not good enough. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, it's not easy being a biographer debating against his own subject. <laughs> it's a little bit as if James Boswell had to debate against Dr. Johnson. So what I propose to do in a rather diplomatic way is to try to show you that Dr. Kissinger and perhaps also Fareed Zakaria are, through no fault of their own, on the wrong side of this resolution. <laughs> Can I quote from Dr. Kissinger's outstanding new book on China, page 493. <laughs> China's quest for equal partnership with the United States is no longer the outsized claim of a vulnerable country. It is increasingly a reality backed by financial and economic capacities. Or I could quote Fareed from his excellent post-American world. China is a country whose scale dwarfs the United States. China is hungry for success. Now, the fascinating thing is that these two great geopolitical thinkers agree that the Chinese economic challenge is also a challenge to the hegemony in the world of the United States. Once again, let me quote Dr. Kissinger's own words. An explicit American project to organize Asia on the basis of containing China or creating a block of democratic states for an ideological crusade is unlikely to succeed. He hopes, as he concludes in his book, for peaceful co-evolution, but he fears a repeat of what happened a hundred years ago when the rise of Germany challenged the predominance of the United Kingdom. But you know, for me, it's not just about China. The key to the 21st century really lies in the decline of the West. A financial crisis caused by excessive borrowing and subsidized gambling. A fiscal crisis that means the United States will soon be spending more on debt interest than on defense. A political crisis exemplified by a game of Russian roulette over the US federal debt ceiling and a moral crisis personified by a legislator named implausibly Wiener sexting miscellaneous women with pictures of his naked torso. <laughs> the 21st century will be China's because an overweight, overleveraged, oversexed America, not to mention a dysfunctional Europe, are on the slide. <laughs> Four decades ago, Richard Nixon got this point sooner than most. Well, you can just stop and think of what would happen if anybody with a decent system of government got control of that mainland. Good God, there'd be no power in the world that could even... I mean, you put 800 million Chinese to work under a decent system, and they will be the leaders of the world. I salute the achievement of that administration in reopening Sino-American relations in 1972. It's an achievement to which no one contributed more than Henry Kissinger. So I don't ask you to vote against him, but for his own analysis. <laughs> which places him and his partner tonight firmly on our side of the debate. I urge you to support the resolution. Thank you. Well, Fried Zakaria, your opening statement, please. Thank you so much. That's a hard act to follow. You know, my role in this, uh, in this debate uh, is, has been to lower the average age of, uh, of this debating team. 
and I am going to try to do that as best I can without also lowering the average IQ, which I fear is also going to happen. So you will bear with me, and Henry will, uh, will correct all the mistakes I make, uh, including, I hope, firing his, uh, his biographer, uh, which certainly should be one of the first steps. No, I actually was a little worried about having to debate with Henry because, you know, the man is a, a legendary genius, but part of debating is sort of listening to the other side, and I remember the story that I was told about Henry, uh, and it's what would, would we journalists call too good to check. So I've never really actually... But it, it was a story that goes like this. Henry Kissinger, as you know, has this legendary accent. And friends of his who are German say to me, he has an accent even in German. Um, <laughs> and so apparently he has an older brother who is a couple of years older than him, and he speaks normal American English. And so somebody asked uh, the brother, he said, what, what explains this difference? He said, it's very simple. Henry never listens. <laughs> so, so as I say, I hope this is too good to check and will crumble uh, uh, upon, uh, upon real fact checking. I want to make three points about, about China. China is not going to be uh, the dominant power of the 21st century. The century is not going to belong to China uh, for three reasons, economic, political and geopolitical. Economic. One thing we've realized over the last few years, I hope, is nothing goes up in a straight line forever. China looks like it is about to inherit the world, but you know, Japan looked like that for a while. It was the second large, uh, largest economy in the world, and I, I don't know how many of you can remember all the tales we were told about how the world was going to become Japanese, we were all going to be eating sushi. Well, I guess we are all eating sushi, <laughs> but the rest of that prediction didn't quite work out. Um, if, if you think about it, most Asian tigers have grown at about 9% a year for 20, 25 years. And then they shift downward, and they shift downward to 6 5%. I'm not predicting any kind of Chinese crash. I'm simply saying that China will probably follow that, that law of large numbers and regress at some point to a slower growth rate, perhaps a little bit later than the others because it is a much larger country. But it is also worth pointing out there are massive inefficiencies built in into the Chinese system. They have a huge property bubble. Their growth is highly inefficient. China takes in, in foreign direct investment every month what India takes in every year and still it only grows two percentage point faster than India. In other words, if you think about the quality of Chinese growth, it's not as impressive as, as appears. It is massive investment, huge number of airports, uh, uh, eight-lane highways, high-speed rail that's being built, and as I say, if you look at what you are getting out of it in terms of the return on investment, not, not as impressive. China has a huge problem that, that it faces. The UN just came out with a report that pointed out that China is going to have a demographic collapse over the next 25 years. It is going to lose 400 million people. Now, there is no point in human history at which you have had a dominant power in the world that is also declining demographically. It simply doesn't happen. And if you want to look at what a, a, a country in demographic de decline looks like, look at Japan and ask yourself, how powerful is it? Politically, even if China is the largest economy in the world, and by the way, those numbers are all based on something called purchasing power parity, uh, where China's GDP gets inflated because the cost of a haircut in Beijing is less than, than one in, in Toronto. But, you know, international power doesn't depend on the price of haircuts. It depends on, the, on, on foreign aid and oil and international uh, 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 investments and aircraft carriers, and for all of that, you need real hard currency, and, and th that adjusts these numbers slightly. But let's say that China does become the largest economy in the world. Does it have the political capacity to exercise the kind of leadership you need? Remember, Japan was the second largest economy in the world for decades, and I, don't see, I, I didn't see any kind of grand hegemonic design. You need to have the political capacity to be able to exercise that kind of leadership. Henry is going to talk more about these issues, but I want to telegraph them by saying this is a country ruled by a political system that is in crisis. Uh, it is unclear whether the next succession that China goes through will look anything like this current one. Uh, it is unclear, you know, it, China has not solved the basic problem of what it is going to do when it creates a middle class and how it will respond to the aspirations of those people. When Taiwan went through a similar process, 
what you saw was a was a, a transition to democracy when South Korea went through you saw a transition to democracy and these were not easy periods these were fairly bloody and chaotic ones and China is as Neil has reminded us a very large country and a very complex country and imagine this kind of political instability and social instability in that pro process and finally I'll make one one point about uh, the geopolitics and again Henry will talk more about this people like to talk about the rise of Asia I grew up in India there is no such thing as Asia, folks. There's China, there's Japan, there's India. They don't much like each other, right? <laughs> and the point of fact is, you are going to find that as China rises, there is going to be a spirited response in India, in, in, in Japan, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in South Korea. You already have begun to see the stirrings of this. China is not rising in a vacuum. It is rising on a continent in which there are many, many competitors. <laughs> Two very professional debaters landing it right, both on the six-minute mark. David Lee, you're next. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As the only one from China, I am extremely handicapped in this debate. <laughs> because, I'm serious, because in my culture and my education, we do not advocate debates, especially not the debate against an elderly sage. <laughs> so today, today, I would urge you to read all the bestsellers done by my co-debaters. They are much better in explaining the huge amount of changes in the past decades, and also even more, the mounting challenges just as Farid just explained to you. Buy their books, you'll get all the challenges and the changes. <laughs> See, today I'm advocating the, their points. However, I would like to share with you three simple points summarized by three keywords. First keyword is energy. I would argue that the amount of changes you have witnessing, we have witnessing in the past decades, at most are only halfway done in the journey of Chinese, Chinese exchanges. What we we'll see is continued change in China. Why? Because there's energy. There's still energy there in our gas tank for continued change, whether it's economic or political. Why? Because the changes came from a big, spectacular, clash between the civilizations between China and the West as early as 170 years ago. The clash was total failure for the Chinese. This came as a big humiliation for us from generations to generations. Even today, our young kids are also taking this lesson. And this huge humiliation created huge amount of reaction and overreactions in the Chinese history including the founding of the Communist Party 90 years ago, almost to the day, which is more, more about establishing a strong and independent China rather than spreading a proletariat revolution all over the world. So after the founding of the Republic 60 years, 62 years ago, we've seen overreactions of the Communist Party and the government in the form of the Great Leap Forward, in the form of the Cultural Revolution, which did not do good for the Chinese own interest. Until 33 years ago, big change happened, which we call reform and opening up. Reform implies gradual and evolutionary non-continuous improvements in our institutions, whether it's political or economic. Opening up means that to learn whatever is best in the West. Initially, people didn't believe in the message of reform and opening up, just like Farid was challenging. Then our great leader Deng Xiaoping said, no debates, just do it. I guess Deng Xiaoping wouldn't be a fan of monk debates. <laughs> it would be a fan, however, of perhaps Nike running shoes. Just do it. <laughs> indeed, indeed, the past 30 years of change showed the, powerfulness, the power of reform and opening up. Today, I will tell you, young people are not satisfied with the progress we have made. They are eager to push for more reforms, more opening up with the power of the internet. That's the first message, energy. So energy is still there in the gas tank. Where are we driving to? What's destination? Destination is a keyword revival, my second word, keyword. The destination is revival of our great civilization 1,500 years ago, like the Tang Dynasty. It's not a revenge with the West. It's not a 
emulation is not to emulate the success of the U.S. in the absolute dominance of the world, rather is revival of the status of the peaceful, self-confident, open-minded civilization such as Tang Tang Dynasty. That's the destination of this change, which is only at most halfway through. That's the second keyword, which is revival. The third keyword I would like to share with you is influence. What kind of influence will China have in the world? Maybe 90 years from now, I would like strongly argue that the influence will be multi-dimensional. First, China's emergence has been given hopes to poor fellows in the world, such as people in Africa. They tell themselves, they, they say to themselves, "Look, China being so poor originally, being so much constrained in natural resources, when China can make it, why not can we ourselves?" So we are giving hope to the young, to the poor fellows in the world. That's first dimension. Second dimension is that China's emergence gives us an alternative model of social and economic institutions, different from the West, different from the U.S. In this model, relative speaking, comparing with the Western model, Western models, more weight is given to social welfare, to social well-being, to social stability, rather than pure individual liberty. The third dimension of influence is international relations. China's revival of the civilization, like in the Tang Dynasty, giving us a new picture of international relations, in which China is looking for peace, looking for collaboration, just like we have been seeing in the past two and a half years of the global financial crisis. So overall, I wouldn't, I wouldn't impose my conclusion upon you. I would like to ask you to draw your, your conclusion. Continuous change with energy, big revival, and a new and positive international influence. You draw your conclusion. Thank you. Well, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but Dr. Kissinger, you have six minutes. For somebody who was brought up on German,、uh, six minutes are barely enough to play the verb. <laughs> My、uh, colleagues up here have spoken of the magnitude of China. I admire China. I respect its tremendous achievement, and nobody can deny. And in fact, I would affirm. What China has achieved in the 40 years that I've been able to observe it directly, but the issue before us is whether the 21st century belongs to China, and I would say that China will be preoccupied with enormous problems internally, with domestically. With its immediate environment, and that I have enormous difficulty imagining a world dominated by China. And indeed, as I will conclude, I believe that the concept that some country will dominate the world is in itself a misunderstanding of the world in which we now live. China has achieved great things economically, but it has to produce every year 24 million jobs. It has to absorb six million people moving into the cities every year. It has to deal with a floating population of 150 to 200 million. It has to accommodate a society. In which the coastal regions are at the level of advanced countries, and the interior regions are at the level of、uh, underdevelopment, and they have to accommodate all of this in a political system that must take care both of the economic change that is being produced and the political adaptation that inevitably has to result. From these huge figures that are involved in 
in the economic change. In the geopolitical situation, China historically has been surrounded by a group of smaller countries which themselves were not individually able to threaten China, but which united could pose a threat to China, and therefore, historically, Chinese foreign policy can be described as barbarian management. So China has never had to deal in a world of countries of approximately equal strength. And so to adjust to such a world is in itself a profound challenge to China, which now has 14 countries on its borders, some of which are small but can project their nationality into China, some of which are large and historically significant, so that any attempt by China to dominate the world would evoke a counter-reaction that would be disastrous for the peace of the world. And the quote that Neil Ferguson, who, of course, as my biographer, will have the last word, no matter what I say here. <laughs> uh, uh, spoke about the military uh, containment of, of China. So I would say that one of our challenges is to accommodate the rights of China. One of China's challenges is to accommodate itself to a world in which it is not hegemonial as it has been through 18 of the last 20 centuries in the world that it knew best. So if I may take the liberty of rephrasing what the topic before us, the issue before the world is not whether the 21st century belongs to China, but whether in the 21st century, when China undoubtedly will get stronger, we in the West can work with China and whether China can work with us to create an international structure in which perhaps for the first time in history a rising state has been incorporated into an international system and strengthen the peace and progress. I say in my book that based on experience, the prospects are not optimistic. But on the other hand, we have never had to deal before with proliferation, environment, cyberspace, and a whole set of other problems that can be dealt with only on a universal basis. And I'm this is why I do not believe four seconds, uh, on the clock to, it belongs uh, wrap up your to opening China. Statement. No, please, take, uh, take uh, a few more sentences just to conclude your final thought there. Well, my, I, my conclusion is that the issue is not whether the 21st century belongs to China, but whether we can make it belong to a more universal conception. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you've heard, a series of fascinating lines of argument have begun to crystallize in this debate. And to keep it going, I want to ask our, uh, both teams of debaters now to quickly respond to what they've heard in their opponents' opening statements. Specifically, what do they disagree with most? And Neil, as we agreed, I wanted to come to, to you first for your rebuttal. Well, let's just take one point, and I assume you don't want me to wander around the stage anymore. Whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody else wanders around the stage. So. <laughs> I mean, what are these for? 
My question to Farid is, if you're right, and if China is going to repeat Japanese history, just think what that means, considering Japan's much smaller size, and considering China's relatively low level of development, as both of you have pointed out, if you're right, and China's going to reenact Japan's economic history, then it surely will own the 21st century. Because before it slows down in the way that Japan has since the late 1980s, it will achieve an enormous share, not only of global GDP, but also of global power. Because unlike Japan, China never lost its sovereignty through the kind of military defeat that Japan suffered in 1945. So it, both economically and geopolitically, the prospect of China repeating Japanese history should really be quite a scary one for your side of the debate. Free? Well, uh, since uh, I'm an American trained in the Oprah Winfrey style, I intend to come out and, uh, and, and you're all my friends. Um, <laughs> and if you, you hope. And if, if you look under your seats, you will see you're all going to Australia. <laughs> if you vote for, for our side of this debate. Um, look, the, the Japan example is simply to point out that nothing moves in a straight line, that, that countries, particularly as they ascend the economic modernization scale, find that they have problems. Uh, if you look at the number of countries that have been able to get past about $12,000 per capita GDP over the last 100 years, it is an astonishingly small number. Uh, it is about five. You know, you have lots of countries that manage to do well at basic manufacturing, they begin the reform process, the government gets out of the economy. Then it turns out you've got to modernize every element of your society to move up into that final stage that South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong have been able to do. And I simply point out that China, with, its econo with, with the economic problems it faces, with the political problems it faces, with the demographic problems it faces, and with the geopolitical problems it faces, might find that, that la th those last period, that last period, will be somewhat rocky and it may be complex and as Henry pointed out, it may re require that China stay internally focused and internally absorbed in a way that will not allow it uh, to project this kind of enormous power hegem in hegemonic terms. I don't doubt that China is going to be an enormous economy. I don't doubt that China is going to be an enormous player on the world stage. The question is, will it own the 21st century? Will it dominate it? And I say for all those reasons, it's not going to do that. So, David, um, good point. Come back on this, because it was a subject of a lot of debate before this debate. The Japan example, the years of GDP growth, the close state coordination of their economy, and maybe more importantly, the sense uh, that Japan in the 80s was a civilization like China, one that had a lot of homogeneity and one a lot, a lot of energy like you described China having today. Why isn't uh, Japan's recent past China's near future? Let me respond to your question and Faree's points and uh, Dr. Kissinger's point all together. I think your arguments are all right. These points are even better made 20 or even 30 years ago about China, right? But despite all these claims, China has been growing. China has been changing for the past 30 years, right? These points didn't change. My point is that today's China, despite all these mounting challenges, are still making changes. Let's compare China with Japan. In Japan, I don't think they will have, there had been any fundamental changes before the collapse starting in the early 1990s. In China, we do see that. Also, in comparing with Japan, Japan has been learning from China. I wouldn't argue Japan was one of the primary cultures in the world, while China has been until big spectacular crash with Western countries. Also, on the point of read about economic growth rate, I fully agree with you. Now, economy as large as China can never grow at the pace of double-digit GDP growth. It will slow down. But don't you realize that when the U.S. was emerging, the U.S. wasn't growing as nearly as fast as China. The U.S. slowed down significantly long before the U.S. became the world power. However, it was keeping growing. So today's China, I do see energy, I do see changes ongoing. Now, finally, I would point out a point at Dr. Kissinger. He has been referring back to the past 18 centuries in China. Fully agree. However, there's one difference here. In today's China, we have been sending out huge, I wouldn't say sending out, there are a huge number of young kids coming 
to the outside world to study. How many young kids imagine six the size, six times the University of Toronto, that size of students being studying in the U.S. and in Canada? These are sources of change. These are learning. So people's outlook, people's skills have been learning. So I do think China's emergence will be different from the emergence of, China, of the U.S. and also it will not repeat the problems of Japan. Thank you. Dr. Kissinger, would you like to offer a rebuttal? Uh, that China is changing is undoubtedly the case. If one compares what China looked like in 1971 to what it looks like today, it has physically changed and it has demographically changed in a fundamental way through the one-child family, which is changing in a way the value system uh, in a, a predictable future, in about 30 years, there will be only two uh, people of working age taking care of retirement uh, people. In 2005, there were 9.2 people uh, that were uh, able to, uh, to deal with the retirement uh, people. So this creates a different set of attitudes. But one must not confuse magnitude with global influence. China will have to be preoccupied with the adjustments to, the, to urbanization, with the adjustments to demography, and with the in adjustments to an international system in which it will be a permanent uh, participant rather than the center of the universe as it had been historically conceived. Uh, these are soluble problems, but they are not necessary. They should not be identified with the Western notions of uh, imperialism. Historically, the Chinese role internationally has been, uh, in, has been based on uh, gaining respect for its conduct. It is not being culturally geared to a global role. And I believe that for China to manage its environment, its domestic situation, requires cooperation with the West rather than attempt to dominate the West. Fried, you want to, uh, yes, please. Fried, you wanted to weigh in on this point also? Well, I just actually wanted to ask if uh, one is allowed to ask Absolutely. questions. Absolutely. Right? Questions are so encouraged. I wanted to ask Neil uh, a question, which was, uh, I, I mean, I could have done this, I suppose, if I were not as lazy by reading all of Neil's 46 books and finding uh, <laughs> uh, quotations that contradict his, uh, his current position. But instead, I'm going to put this very simply, which is Neil is a very keen student of geopolitics. And I wondered how, what he made of the fact that China is rising, uh, and it is undoubtedly rising, but not in a geopolitical vacuum. If you just look at the last year, uh, last year China had a good year. It had a good financial crisis. It came out of it feeling confident. Uh, and the manner in which it behaved, uh, in Copenhagen it humiliated the United States and humiliated the President of the United States and refused to, to, bro to, to uh, sign up for a deal. On the Senkaku Islands it, it uh, angered uh, Japan uh, enormously. Uh, on uh, the North Koreans uh, sunk a South Korean uh, boat and the uh, South Koreans asked the Chinese, to, uh, the Chinese to condemn it. They refused, enraging the South Koreans. The Vietnamese and the Filipinos were enraged because China asserted sovereignty over the South China Seas. That's just in one year, right? And that's when China isn't even yet gotten to the point where it is, in fact, the dominant economic power in the world. Do you think all these countries are going to just roll back and accept Chinese domination, or are you likely to see a spirited response from the Indias and Vietnams and South Koreas and Japans and Indonesias of the world, in which case, all of a sudden, this, uh, this, this proposition doesn't look uh, as rosy as it did? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for, for, for that question. I've noticed in your recent columns for Time magazine you've been dabbling econ in economics, and so this gives me a, <laughs> an opportunity to help you out. Um, <laughs> you see, the thing about China's growth during the financial crisis is that it fundamentally altered China's role in the world economy. Up until the financial crisis, the main story was that China was competing with other emerging markets uh, for market share in developed economies like uh, Canada's or the United States. Uh, it was an exporter of, uh, of cheap goods, and it was essentially able to beat most of the emerging market competition with the so-called China price. And then the financial crisis struck, and those developed economies went into recession or near depression. What happened? China engaged in the biggest and most successful stimulus in the world, and in so doing, its role changed. It ceased to be a competitor with other emerging markets, and it became their market of first resort. They found that the most dynamic market they could sell to was China's. And so in an amazing reversal of fortune, trade patterns around the world shifted, and China's neighbors, right the way throughout Asia, including uh, India, where you were born, discovered a new China, not a competitor, but a market they could sell to. And that trend is just going to keep on going, because the whole aim of China's latest five-year plan is to shift from exports to domestic demand, to consumption. That's why your idea that all these little Asian countries are going to band together against nasty China is a total fantasy. They depend on China economically more than they ever have. And if you go to Seoul, and talk to people there in South Korea. Travel anywhere in the region. Talk to Mukesh Ambani, uh, India's richest man. He'll tell you just how big the China business now is for the rest of Asia. And that seems to me one very good reason why, yeah, the 21st century is going to belong to China, because their markets are going to belong to China. Can, can I... Uh, can I tell you? This debate is proceeding nicely. I'm going to go to you, David, quickly, and then back to uh, Farid, and then we're going to start looking for a couple of questions. Farid was absolutely right in observing the tensions in the last one year. But we have to go deeper. We don't have to just stay in the television surface. Go to deeper. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not... <laughs> Televisions are important, <laughs> especially GPS program, which I like very much. <laughs> Look behind, beyond the surface. What, who were the ad, 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 aggressors? Who were the provocative party? It was not China. Take the issue of the Sak Sakaku Island in Japan. It was the Japanese government which arrested and using domestic law against Chinese sailors about in a disputed island. The Chinese side was the pacifier, was trying to make peace with the issue. Take the issue of a Copenhagen negotiation. It is Chinese side trying to make meaningful agreement with other countries. On this issue of negotiation, the Chinese side is extremely handicapped because whatever the Chinese government commits today or at that time, the government has to honor because we cannot claim we have a change of parliament. The parliament nullified the agreement. <laughs> In the case of the US, I'm sorry, I've been a scholar. I can be very open, I can be very blunt. It was a show for the new President Obama, trying to go everywhere, negotiate, and in the end, expecting the Congress to kill the deal, not in China. Okay, I would suggest you to look at other evidence. During the financial crisis in the past almost three years, it was China trying to stabilize the global financial system. During the peak days of the financial crisis, the RMB did not depreciate against the US dollar, unlike many other currencies. Also, during the whole financial, uh, financial crisis period, China did not sell massive amount of treasury bond holding. China has been the most patient long-term investor supporting today's Europe and supporting the U.S. government, which has trouble in lifting the ceiling and running the risk of default. So I suggest you, suggest you to look at the big picture and also go underneath the surface. Thank you. Just a quick point. Neil is, of course, an incredibly accomplished economic historian, and so he understands the economics of, of Asia so well. But I would point out that throughout history, people have gone to war and countries have had 
spirited geopolitical rivalries despite the fact that they have been economically interdependent. Thucydides, the first great historian, talked about the, war, the Peloponnesian War and his first explanation for the reason was honor and dignity. It had nothing to do with economics. If you looked at uh, Europe on the, ver on the eve of the First World War, you saw a, a continent that was economically more interdependent by some measures than, than the countries of the world today. Uh, and in fact, the level of economic interdependence between Britain and Germany was such that it was a, in, in, in some ways madness that these two countries went to war, but still they did. In fact, there was a very famous uh, uh, book written by a young historian who talked about the fact that perhaps Britain should not have gone to war because in fact this was, this was craziness for Britain to do it and it was a pity, of the pity of war. Oh, wait a minute, that historian was Neil Ferguson. <laughs> Well, before we... Uh, it's all night. <laughs> so he read one of my books. And later. we'll stay here to listen. <laughs> That's a start. Uh, right here. Yes. Uh, before we end the rebuttal uh, portion of this debate, I'd like to allow Dr. Kissinger uh, the last word. Well, I, uh, I don't know whether one can reverse the order of participants up here because I think it's three to one against my friend Neil. <laughs> 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 our, Chinese, our Chinese friend is saying that China has suffered a great deal, has been provoked on, uh, through a century of Western exploitation, and that it is not trying to dominate the world. As I understand what he is saying, it is this. When the West wants to discuss climate, or the financial system. Our tendency is to say China can be a stakeholder. It can be a participant in a system they did not themselves participate in creating. So the issue is whether it is possible to create an international system in which China participates in the creation of it without dominating it. This is really what we're debating here. And if I understand the observations of uh, our Chinese colleague, he's not saying that China will dominate the world. He's saying China is making great progress and that China wants to be heard. And that in such issues as climate, the United States should not present them with a finished product and ask for its agreement. All of this we agree with on this side of, uh, of the aisle. So if you would like to move your chair <laughs> over to our side, we will welcome you. A fabulous uh, debate. We're now going to move into the, uh, the question and answer uh, portion of this evening. And a bit like Fareed's opening remarks, we're going to break it down into three sections because I think we all agree there are three main dimensions to the pros and cons of China's rise in the coming century. The economic dimension, the political and cultural dimension, and of course the geopolitical dimension. And to start us off uh, in our first section on the economy, I want to go to someone in the audience who's written a number of best-selling books on economic themes, including Dead Aid, a great uh, bestseller here in Canada, and How the West Was Lost, and she is Dambisa Moyo. Dambisa, if I could have your one question, please. Um, yes, thank you. Um, my question is actually to Mr. Lee and Mr. Ferguson. Um, until now, a key piece of China's development strategy has been to use soft power, vast resources, to accumulate and access natural resources such as land, water, uh, energy and minerals. Um, and effectively, China has been free riding off of the United States who's been underwriting um, public goods such as national security uh, around the world. 
As we head towards 9 billion people on the planet in 2050 and, and add 2 billion people into the middle class in 2030, um, my question to you is how aggressive do you think China will become in her efforts to secure natural resources? Um, in other words, what is the likelihood that China moves from the soft power strategy of accumulating resources to one where she becomes more, um, more depends more um, aggressively on hard power and therefore adopts more military and colonial-like strategies of, adopt, of accumulating resources, particularly in the context of Africa. Well, Dan Beas, it's great to have you here, and I hesitate to answer a question from you on the subject of Africa. Uh, but it seems to me, having uh, recently visited Zambia, uh, and last year having been uh, in Senegal and Namibia, that something very important is happening in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in which China is leading a whole new developmental push, radically different in its nature, from the aid programs that you so persuasively argued had been a failure when the West uh, tried them. Now, this is a developmental strategy based on self-interest. Uh, China is developing natural resources like copper in the Zambian copper belt because it desperately needs copper to wire its vast new cities. But the effect in Africa is by no means all bad. And I think it's a, a really big misrepresentation to suggest that this is a rerun of 19th century colonialism. That was the question in my mind when I went to Zambia. It wasn't the answer that I found. I don't think that is the Chinese approach. And in many ways, I think what they're doing is very consonant with what you argued in Dead Aid. They're investing. They're trying to make money. They're letting the market drive uh, African economic development rather than handouts and a culture of uh, dependency. Would this ultimately lead to conflict of the sort that you suggest? A sort of scramble for Africa as in the late 19th century? It's conceivable, but I see absolutely no sign of it at the moment. There's only one country scrambling for Africa right now, and it's China. Let Uh, let me follow up uh, Neil's great points by adding three simple observations. Number one, intention. First, China doesn't have the intention to go with the old path of colonial, colonialism in the, in the old days. There's no intention like that. To the contrary, China has been working hard collaborating with African countries. Look at the summit, African summit, which was very, very popular about three years ago. And most of the African leaders and people and business people are very, very enthusiastic about Chinese investments. That's intention. Second, capacity. Look at the Chinese reality. We are still an extremely poor economy with per capita GDP around 4,000 US dollars. So there's a long way to go for economic growth. Meanwhile, it implies that there's absolutely no capacity to colonize all these African countries, even if China were trying to do. Number three, you have to look at China. Within China, there has been tremendous, tremendous efforts in pushing for new technologies to conserve resources, new technologies to enhance uh, e e e uh, energy efficiency, and also there are policies to express policies to enhance resource prices in order to encourage conservation. So in my mind, China will have a new road, a new pattern of modernization, which again will give hopes to the poor fellows in the world. Thank you. I want to ask you though, Dr. Kissinger, isn't it one of the, the traps that uh, nations that begin to assume a global power status fall into, which is their supply lines, the resources that they have to sustain in countries around the world to fund their development? Do you think China is at risk here of either reaching beyond itself, and as Dembisa said, having to project beyond soft power, hard power, to defend these lines of resources back to China? Well, that China will want to acquire resources for its industry. It's a natural evolution. Uh, whether it will, whether it believes that in order to have the access to these resources, it must also be militarily dominant 
That's another decision. If you look at the rights of Germany before World War I, uh, the world would probably have been able to live with the Germany having the largest land army. But when on top of it, it tried to develop the largest uh, uh, naval force, it began to threaten the long-term existence of, of Great Britain. So there are two challenges. We have to understand that China will get stronger and we cannot read, act neurologically to every indication of Chinese strength. But the Chinese, China has to learn some self-limitation in the way it vindicates its interests around the world. Both, both of these sentences have to exist. It cannot be done by one uh, nation alone. Uh, it has to be done collaboratively. Great way in on this. Can I just add w just one line, which is I think that David po said that China's investments in Africa are very popular. I think it would be more accurate to say that China's investments in Africa are very popular with its dictators. Um, I think that... I, I, I was in Kenya a, a year and a half ago, and I a asked a, a group of Kenyan parliamentarians what their main concern was. We were talking about democracy, human rights, and things like that, and they said the single biggest concern we have is that China is going around Africa making deals with Africa's dictators with no questions asked and no accountability on any human rights issues. I would argue, I would argue that, I would argue that that is the prob possibly an exaggeration, but certainly something that they have to be worried about and worry about from a, from a long-term geopolitical sense. We discovered in the Middle East that we thought we had very stable relations with all these countries in the Middle East. It turned out we had very stable relations with all the dictators of the Middle East. Well, hang on a second. Wait a <laughs> second. Wait a second. Farid, I'm a historian more than I'm a connor. Remind me, are you saying that Western powers never did deals with African dictators? <laughs> and this is some new and terrible deformity of Chinese policy? You know, I go to Africa, as I said, too. I, I spoke to the miners in the Copper Belt who had no jobs when the state-owned mining system collapsed and now have jobs because the Chinese reopened the mines and not only reopened them but extended them. It's not fair to say that China only deals with African dictators. It deals with African democracies. It deals with the governments it finds in Africa, including the governments that Western powers propped up for too many years. I, I, I make no apologies for the West on this issue. I'm, I make no apologies for the West. I'm, I'm simply pointing out that, I, that China is doing what, what it's doing with, with, with a leadership class that may not reflect the, the, the wishes of the entire African but public. But would you say that would Africa be better off if China didn't invest there? No, I'm not Would saying, Africa be better I'm off if China wasn't its biggest trading partner? I think that's the kind of hypocritical argument that if I were Chinese, I'd find quite annoying. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> you're obviously finding it annoying even though you're not Chinese. <laughs> Well, just keeping on uh, the economic theme, um, <laughs> I'm going to have to separate these guys. Um, I'm holding in my hand uh, what many people consider to be the quintessential consumer success product of the last decade, the, the Apple iPhone. It'd be interesting to see how many other fellow Apple iPhone users there are out there in the audience tonight. If you've got one, put it up in the air. Hey, I see a few. I see more and more. Wow, look at that. If, if I may tout Canada's <laughs> virtues. Hey, that's not fair. Neil, could you pull out a blackberry? This is a, this is a fountain pen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this phone, uh, we know, is manufactured in China by Foxconn. Uh, it is, however, designed in Cupertino, California. The software that power it was thought by Steve Jobs, by his team at Apple. And that wow factor, the, the thing that makes this, the design factor that makes this such a coveted device for millions of people around the world, 
leads me to ask both you, Neil, and David, can China do this? Can China innovate in the same way and on the same scale as an Apple, as a Google, as a rim here in Canada? Because they've got to do it if you think that they can own the 21st century. David, why don't you take this one? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Remember, remember, no country starting from being very poor could innovate overnight. It's a learning process. I told you before, it's opening up, learning whatever is good in the West, sending out students, tens, hundreds of thousands of students in the West to learn, and then gradually innovate. Remember, China couldn't innovate anything 30 years ago. Now, at least, we have rapid train railroads, where the U.S. is still struggling, right? Remember, today, we have some automobile cars, which are not only cheaper, but also more efficient than the GMs. Remember, the GMs, most profit comes from China today. It would, if it were not for Chinese operations, GM could have been using more U.S. government money in bailing out. <laughs> it's a simple fact. So it's a learning process, it's a gradual process. I'm sure in the long run, China will innovate. Whether China will have iPhones in the future, that's a different issue. There are different levels of innovation. The U.S., it is only in the U.S. that iPhones, iPad were innovated, right, were invented. So my vision of China is, yes, we will innovate. However, being coming from a different economic and social institutions, we may not be at the very, very cutting edge of innovation, but you don't need to be that very, very leading edge, cutting edge in order to be a respected and important country in the world. You gradually improve, improve. the process will lead you to somewhere. Okay, Neil, very briefly. You know, I've heard that story about the iPhone so many times, and it's a symptom of Western complacency, as if we'll always have the cool ideas and they'll always do the assembly line. That is so out of date. That is 10 years out of date. We're not talking about the future here. China is going to overtake Germany in terms of internationally recognized patents in the next couple of years. And that is because of a huge effort by China's educational institutions, like the one where David works, to raise the game in research and development, in producing people with PhDs, not in media studies, but PhDs in engineering and in physics. And that is going to work, ladies and gentlemen. Fried, I'd like to come to you on this point, too, because it's something that you write about a lot in, in Time and the Washington Post and talk about on your show. Can China innovate, though, without a free and open society, without universities where you have total freedom of thought and inquiry, without a culture that allows the, the Mavericks, the Steve Jobs, uh, the Jim Balsleys, the others to emerge? Do you think that can happen? Look, first let me say that I, broadly speaking on this issue, actually agree with, with, with Neil and David that it is a mistake to assume that there is some kind of genetic uh, deformation that doesn't allow the Chinese to innovate. Of course they're going to innovate, and of course they're going to do things that are interesting. I mean, the point that Henry and I keep making is they're going to innovate, we're going to innovate, this is going to be a world of multiplicities. I mean, that's why I didn't call the book the Chinese world or the Indian world. It's, it is genuinely a post-American world. There will be a, a lot of innovation going on. But one, one qualifying thought, if you look at Apple, and we think about what innovation is, Apple is generally regarded as the most innovative com company in the world right now. It wins all the, the, the lists. Apple spends on R&D in one year what Microsoft spends, I mean, I, I, Apple spends on R&D in one decade what Microsoft spends in one year. If you rank Apple in terms of, if you, if you look at the list of R&D spending uh, of technology companies, Apple is 82nd. It spends 50% of what most computer companies spend. Apple's innovations are in design and in the way in which human beings use technology. That, uh, that may be something you learn when you get a PhD in media studies. Um, <laughs> it, 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 if you look, and by the way, this is, this is true throughout, throughout history. Um, uh, the, the invention of the sewing machine, the, the, the singer's great, uh, great skill was not coming up with the best machine. It was he figured out that you sell it to women on an installment plan. Nobody had ever sold machinery to women before. Google's great innovation may not actually be the search engine, it may be the advertising program that goes along with it. So 
part of what innovation is, is this strange combination of science and consumer behavior and business. I mean, the great invention that launched capitalism was double entry bookkeeping. It wasn't, it wasn't some, you know, some scientific gizmo. Of course, China will innovate in its own way. But there is something about the ecosystem of America, which has this, all the things that we all know. Also, I think most importantly, has the ability to question hierarchy, which is absolutely key. You know, I, I hear all these people talking about Asian education and the tiger mom, you know, way of parenting. Look, I, I went through an Asian educational system. I think it's pretty lousy. You just do its rote memorization towards some big exam, and when you've taken the exam, the day after the exam, you forget promptly everything you've learned. The American system, I think, is much better in that it teaches you to think, it teaches you to problem solve, it teaches you to love learning for the rest of your life. It is a continuous process, and it doesn't make you feel ashamed of failure. The ability to fail efficiently is an incredibly powerful part of innovation. So, China will innovate, but I think that the United States has something very special about it. Yes. Yes, well, I want to move on to the second part of our question and answer uh, session, which is politics and culture. And to do that, to kick us off, I'd like to call on uh, Janice Stein. She's head of the Monk School of Global Affairs, a, a well-known foreign affairs commentator here in Canada. Janice, let's have your question. Thank you very much, uh, Rudyard. And this question is to David Lee and to Fareed Zakaria both. Um, the world watched recently with astonishment uh, as young people streamed into the squares in the streets in Tunisia and in Egypt uh, to demand political rights and um, to demand that authoritarian and corrupt leaders uh, leave the scene. Uh, now, the parallels between the Arab world and China uh, are as far from perfect. China is a mature society. The Arab world is young. China has created hundreds of millions of jobs. Arab governments have not. But, but, but... China, like the Arab world, tolerates almost no dissent. And again, like the Arab world, there is growing income inequality within China. So my question is, China is about to undergo a leadership transition. Will there be growing demand for political rights in China? And how will the leadership cope? Thank you for this question. I knew this question would come up. <laughs> I don't need to be reminded of the Arab Spring. We knew this long before, since the day one of economic reform. After economic success, people knew in China that there will be more voices, there will be more demand for expressing opinions and political participation in decision-making. That is why it is very clear from day one people knew in China economic institutional change will go hand in hand with political institutional change. I think the biggest misunderstanding about China is that we do have political institutional change, starting with the way leaders are being selected. Today, the way leaders are being selected and, pub and public decisions being made are much, much, much more sophisticated than before. So as we speak, Today, young people in China are able to express their opinions in the internet, and in most cases, the voices are being heard and public decisions are being changed. So I would invite you and all friends in Canada and the US to go to China, to talk to young people, to visit the Chinese websites, to understand the new way of reform being done, to understand the new way in which people express their opinions and express their dissidents, and then the new way in which public decisions take into account of the popular opinions of people, especially young people. Thank you. Uh, look, five years ago, I think I would have agreed with David. There was, it was very clear in China that there was a movement towards very gradual and very limited, but real political reform. I think that over the last five years, what you have seen is economic reform and economic growth has proceeded apace, 
but there has been a drawing back of any kind of political reform. And as events have seemed to take place around the world that suggest some dangers, such as the Arab Spring, to, to maintaining this political control, what you don't see in China is an opening up, uh, is an attempt to uh, announce a series of ambitious political reforms. In fact, you see a closing down so that China now makes it, Ill if you type the word jasmine into, a, into Google in China, you will come up against a, a, a blank page uh, because of fear that somehow the jasmine revolution will, will, will take root in China. If you look at the internet in general, China has, by some accounts, a million people monitoring the internet. Uh, text phone messages are monitored. Uh, if you look at my one, uh, you know, per personal slice of this, I got a, an interview with Wen Jiabao for my program. Very important interview. I was honored to get it. The Chinese government announced it because it was seen as very important. Premier Wen made some fairly harmless comments about how China would eventually evolve politically. The, the, the interview was banned on Chinese TV. It was taken off Chinese websites. Then a series of Chinese journalists protested the, the fact that this had been uh, censored. Their protest letter, which was on a, a newspaper website, was then taken off and censored. This does not strike me as political reform. This strikes me as a kind of circling of the wagons, a fear of what's happening next. Um, look, clearly China has been moving and giving greater and greater freedom to its people. I don't doubt that at all. But they have to figure out how they are going to create a political system that accommodates this rising middle class in a world in which people are demanding greater and greater accountability from their leaders. Uh, and they, this, you know, in some ways, when I look at India and China, I think to myself, you know, uh, China has solved all the small problems. They've built the best roads and the best highways and the best high-speed rail, and they've done this so magnificently that it puts India to shame. But India has solved one big problem, which is what will it look like 25 years from now politically? It'll be the same crazy, chaotic democracy as it is today, <laughs> right? What will China be 25 years from now politically? Will you still have this Mandarin elite? The Communist Party of China is today the most elite political organization in the world. Everybody looks like David. They all have PhDs and they're engineers, but that's not China. You know, the, the, the people they rule are this vast mass of peasantry. And they are not being re those people are not reflected in the political system. Uh, their views, to a large extent, are, are, are filtered through these many mechanisms. That strikes me as a huge political challenge for China going forward. Dr. Kissinger, I think this audience wants to hear you on this question too, and maybe to push your mind forward in the decades to come when there will be a generation of Chinese leaders without memories of the Cultural Revolution, without memories of a diminished China. How is that generation going to approach the challenges of political form? Will they embrace it or will they re-entrench? I believe that the next decade will see, will see China wrestling with the problem of how to bring its political institutions in line with its economic development. I think that the, when you have the vast economic changes, the migration of people, the spread of education, it is absolutely inevitable that that question will be one of the dominant issues of the uh, uh, new leadership that is coming up in, uh, in a year and a half. Uh, what form it will take, whether it will be the form of Western parliamentary democracy or some new form that we haven't seen yet, the outcome will have to be more transparency and more participation and I believe the next leadership change, uh, which is due in 10 years from now, will, almost, will, will reflect this. Uh, this is, and this is also why I do not believe, to get back to what is simple as here, that a people, that, that a country that will be so preoccupied with this fundamental change 
will also have time <laughs> to concentrate on dominating the world. I'm going to let uh, Neil come in on this before moving to the third and final block of our question and answer, which will be on, on geopolitics. So, Neil, have, have a go. You know, I remember reading a book a few years back with a title like <laughs> The Future of Freedom, in which a brilliant young journalist argued that there were problems with Western democracy, and especially with American democracy, that were only going to get worse. Hey, that was you! <laughs> We are making a big mistake, and I know Dr. Kissinger will agree with me on this, though he doesn't need to move over here yet. <laughs> if we think there is one universal model of Western democracy that absolutely everybody is going to adopt at some point between now and 2050, if you think that that is what the future of the world is going to look like, you are going to be one very, very disappointed person, starting in the Middle East. The chances of Western-style democracy emerging in any of these countries has to be, you know, between 0 and 5% at best. The, pos the possibility of alternative models was something that was raised by David right at the beginning of his thoughtful opening remarks, and I want you to think very seriously about what that imply implies. Singapore is not worrying about a jasmine revolution. Singapore is the model. Think of China as a giant technocratic Singapore in which the one-party state evolves itself in ways that avoid the catastrophe, the collapse, of the Soviet experience. Second point, and this is where we differ, it is precisely when nations are struggling with problems of internal political reform and challenges from below that they are most likely to pursue a more assertive and aggressive foreign policy. This must be one of the lessons of modern history, indeed of ancient history. And that is one reason why I think it is precisely at this time of political stress that we are likely to see a more nationalistic and a more assertive China. And that is one of the reasons I'm arguing for this motion tonight. To start off our final section of these question and answer uh, period on geopolitics, I want to call on someone who's thought long and hard about the practicalities of China's rise. He's William Cohen, and he's the former U.S. Secretary of Defense. If I could, I'd like to respond or at least to reply to the um, reference to Singapore. Uh, by Mr. Ferguson. I was just there a couple of weeks ago and they had the so-called uh, Singapore uh, dial Shangri-La Dialogue. And uh, Secretary Gates was there making a very strong statement about the need for the United States to remain deeply engaged uh, in the Asia-Pacific region. And the reason he made the statement was to counter the, or at least satisfy the Asian nations. Uh, one of whom, one uh, young man I talked to was Simon Tay, you quote in your book, uh, Fareed, that no one in Asia wants to be dominated by China. There is no aspiration for the Chinese dream, as there might be for the American dream. Uh, but there is growing concern that as China continues to expand its economy, it's also expanding its military. Uh, and there is concern that the United States perhaps is looking more internally now because of our debt problems and others, that we will not be there in sufficient uh, numbers or at least presence. And so they would like very much for the United States uh, to become even more engaged. And the question I have for either Dr. Kissinger or you, know, you Fareed, because in your book you raise this issue, you said the United States must look for ways to cooperate with China. And there are a number of things that we can always cooperate on, and the list is uh, pretty public. But there are other areas of friction. Uh, be Taiwan or the South China Sea. And the question is, you suggest that we need to draw lines with China, but we can't draw them everywhere. We have to be very careful uh, in how we draw those lines. And the question I have, would you suggest uh, or support drawing the line at China's assertion of sovereignty over the South China Sea? Because this does raise all of the questions that you mentioned uh, in terms of uh, certainly uh, um, uh, Indonesia, uh, with Malaysia, 
uh, also the Philippines, uh, and uh, also the others in the region. They are very concerned, and most ironically, Vietnam asking for the United States to play a role in helping to resolve the issues of sovereignty and territorial integrity. So I would ask you, do you think that this is an area where you would recommend that we draw the line with China, and how would we draw it? To answer your specific question, uh, I think freedom of the seas is a fundamental principle of American policy and has been a fundamental uh, principle of, of the international systems. So I would oppose the notion that any sea uh, should, be a, should be treated as a territorial uh, issue. And uh, secondly, there are, of course, a series of specific issues about the uh, possession of a series of islands and, and, and rocks, and that should be dealt with, uh, hopefully, by negotiation. Uh, but on the fundamental issue, uh, I would apply the principle of uh, freedom of disease to South China Sea, as I would do any other uh, open ocean. Uh, the second uh, point I want to make, however, is this. Uh, we can, of course, define the emerging relationship with China as an ability to draw lines and then uh, uh, see whether confrontations succeed along these lines. I believe that this would be extraordinarily dangerous to begin thinking of international relations as a question of military containment uh, of China. It is not a question of military containment of China. It is a question of, of dealing with China's inevitable rise. Uh, China has to restrain itself within uh, definable limits. We, we cannot ask China to solve all our internal problems for us. We have to remain competitive. If we remain competitive, uh, then the next challenge is to see whether a dialogue can develop between China and us and other countries that share our views on what the world, what we intend the world to look like five to ten years from now. I keep asking the question that Neil asked in his first book, which is this. If the leaders of Europe had known in 1914 what the world looked like in 1919, would they ever have believed that what happened in Sarajevo justified the tens of millions of casualties that resulted? Similarly, I believe the leaders of the world now have to ask themselves, uh, and the leaders of China have to ask themselves, uh, how the evolution, some of which we have discussed here and much more of which can be considered, should be managed in a way that is cooperative rather than confrontational. I, I conducted foreign policy on balance of power principles I know how to play that game. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so it's not that I wouldn't know how, how we should play it. Uh, I was once asked in a Chinese, I spoke to a Chinese group, and somebody got up and said, uh, uh, you're a great friend of China, but we also read your books. <laughs> and, in your books, you talk about the balance of power. How are you going to manage the balance of power? And I said, look around yourself. Look at the countries that border you. And ask yourself whether we, this is not a problem that is conceivable. What I'm, as, what I'm suggesting is, yes, the South China Sea is a clear case to me. Uh, that should not be claimed by, uh, by any nation. 
But what we really should have is that the top leaders uh, begin to ask some of the questions that have been asked around here. Look at where we want to be five to ten years from now and work back from that rather than deal with crisis management uh, month after month and be in a situation in which every time the leaders meet there is a terrific communique and then two months later one has the sort of discussion we have here about where did the Chinese go wrong, where did the West go wrong. Uh, that is my fundamental view. So on the South China, China Sea, I'm, I, it's clear where we should come out with respect to freedom of navigation. Uh, but that is just a symptom. Uh, what is required is an understanding that we are heading into a new world order uh, in which there are now universal issues and that this world order cannot be organized on the same principles as we, as our customary conventional uh, thinking. And this is where the relationship of China becomes so important because China is rising. And the question is, can China learn restraint? And can we learn to accommodate a reduction of our previous influence? That is what we need to deal with. Fried, um, to pick up on, on Dr. Kissinger's last words there, can America learn uh, a pattern of restraint in this new, new phase. Because I think part of, for your side arguing here, part of your, your contention is that for China not to own the century, in some ways it has to not come into conflict with the United States, at least not in military means. So, so give us your sense of where the American polity is at right now vis-a-vis -vis China. Are they willing to accommodate its rise or are we into a much more dangerous dynamic as Dr. Kissinger writes in the final chapter of his book, uh, that we saw in the beginning of the 20th century? You know, everybody uh, tends to view the United States as having this vacillating foreign policy that's unable to get its act together and constantly shifting. Uh, and on China, I have to say, I think that the opposite is the case. Since Henry Kissinger opened China to the world and opened U.S. relations with China, the United States has had a remarkably consistent policy toward China, and that has been to integrate China into the world, to help China gain the knowledge, the, 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 the know-how, the technology, the capital, uh, and the institutional frameworks that will help it become a productive, uh, thriving member of the international community. We have followed that under, under presidents who are Democratic, under Republicans. We have, we, we have managed an extraordinary consistency of policy, even on those issues like red lines, such as our relationship with ta Taiwan, our, our relationship with the Dalai Lama. Every president has maintained a very strong cooperative relationship with China while maintaining some core interests and values that we have thought were important. I, I think that my greatest worry about U.S.-Chinese relations right now is not the United States. I think the United States will continue to play that role and has been trying to do so. The United States has been willing to reform the IMF and the World Bank and all inst international institutions to properly reflect the rise of China and other emerging market countries. Let's be honest, the countries that haven't wanted to do it are the Europeans because it is their uh, voting uh, that, that, that will be diluted in this process. I think that the, 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 the greater danger is that China, going through the kind of political transformation that, uh, that Henry has been talking about, might find itself in a de very different road. And here I'm only quoting back what Neil Ferguson was saying quite rightly. China is becoming more nationalistic, more assertive, more arrogant. There is a, there is a growing sense in China that the policies that Deng Xiaoping outlined, hide your light, light under a bushel, uh, you know, uh, cooperate with the United States, are not as relevant. Uh, people openly say that was at a time when we had the Soviet Union that was our enemy. We needed the United States. We needed it for technology. We needed it for capital. We now have the capital. We needed it for WTO membership. We have all those things. We don't need those things. So the great discontinuity is more likely to be Chinese than, than the United States. 
Good. So, David, that uh, poses a, a vital question for your side, which is, will China push on certain red lines? Will a new generation of Chinese leadership take those risks? Well, my observation is that the Chinese side is very much willing to work on these difficult issues. The Chinese side has been always saying that we are not making new claims. We are willing to work with multiple parties. However, we are not willing to work with interventionist American policy. The essence of the problem, to me, is that after Asian fin- after the global financial crisis, the confidence, the confidence level in the U.S. has been coming down. So the U.S. side has been giving us very mixed signals. Even though the White House has been very clear in its policy, the Congress, the Congress, and also the candidates for the presidents. Are giving very mixed signals, saying that the Chinese side are screwing up American issues, and many Chinese people do not fully understand American politics. So they take this as a signal that the outside world are becoming more and more hostage, hostile towards the Chinese economic and political emergence. That's the issue. So I would suggest that people in the West. Try to understand the issues. Try to put these relatively small issues in a larger context to understand the Chinese side is not changing. It is the Western side. We and you have to solve your problem all together, starting with the financial problems, starting with the financial system, and then when you are more confident, it's easier for China to work with the West. Thank you. You may not have heard the voice of Chinese power before, ladies and gentlemen. This is what it sounds like. Get used to it, because this is the kind of firm, self-confident, and more assertive China that I have seen more and more in my trips to China and my encounters with Chinese academics and statesmen in recent years. Let's be clear. In all honesty, going right back to the question. Does the United States have the option of drawing lines anywhere in Asia in the way that it did in the days of Eisenhower, or indeed in the days of Nixon? I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so goes right to the point you just made, David. Where are the resources? Look at the Congressional Budget Office projections of where the United States is going to be. I don't know if you saw Jim Baker's article in the Wall Street Journal today. In nine years' time. The United States will be spending more on the interest on the federal debt than on national security. The CBO has projections imagining what the U.S. would save if it reduced its overseas troop presence to 30,000. 30,000. Now, in that world, and we are racing towards that world in this decade right now. The idea that the United States can say to China, "Thus far and no further," and adopt a realpolitik, a balance of power policy, with a threat of military action—that idea becomes less and less plausible. And that's precisely the point of the debate we're having tonight. It's this way that power shifts. It's somewhat imperceptible, but when it shifts, ladies and gentlemen, it talks a little bit like David. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to be conscious of our time, so I'm now going to call on our debaters for their closing arguments. They're each going to be given three minutes to make their case to try to sway any final undecided votes in this hall, and we're going to have our concluding remarks in the opposite order of our opening statements. So, Dr. Kissinger, if you could please begin. The issue is not whether China will grow in magnitude; that will clearly happen. The issue is twofold: how China uses its growing capacities, and secondly, whether the United States and its allies have the willingness to adjust to the new international environment. I see nothing organic in the situation that leads me to believe that China will dominate the 21st century. China will play a larger role in the 21st century. 
the uh, challenge is whether America can redefine itself after its century of, uh, of progress, and similarly, how China redefines itself when it absorbs its economic growth. I believe we do have the capacity to draw lines, but we have to be selective in drawing the lines. And more important than that, we should try to move towards a relationship in which the lines that separate us are not the crucial element, but the things we do together. David Lee, your three minutes, please. Let me start by reiterating a point which I made in the opening remarks. That is, the changes in China, which has been going on for the past three decades, at most are halfway, only halfway done. The country is still changing. We still, gas, we still have gas in our gas tank. The changes will be more than economic. The changes will also be societal and political. Also, I would like to remind you that the destination of China's emergence is not dominance in the world. By no means, China is, or China was, China will dominate the world. There's only one dominance in the world, that is the U.S. today. That is not the dream, not the aspiration of China, not the capacity of China to emulate the success of the U.S. and the dominance of the world. It's simply not in the gene of our Confucius tradition. That being understood, I urge you, I urge you to think from a different perspective. Forget about the fast 500 years of Western philosophy, Western perspective, to look at the international relations as winners and losers. Instead, look from the lens of our traditional philosophers, the Confucius. The Confucius have been advocating for a harmonious, harmonious world in which individuals are at peace with outside the world, and in society, people are at peace with each other, and countries are working with each other to solve international conflicts. So I urge you to from, look from this perspective to understand the ongoing changes in the Chinese economy and society. Finally, let me call upon you to have patience, to understand that we are not bystanders, we are also participants in the Chinese economic and social and political emergence. When we become hostile, when we worry about China's emergence, we worry about the relative decline of the U.S., of the West, we indeed create problems for the world. We indeed provoke the negative forces in China, the suspicious forces in China. Indeed, this world will become a very uncomfortable world. So in the end, I urge you to, un to think about this issue again. China's emergence is not implying that China will dominate the world. The 21st century will belong to China, and it also will belong to any countries, any nations, any people who are willing to follow the flow. Together, we all will own the century. Thank you. Fried Zakaria, you're next. You know, we are going through a crisis of confidence in the Western world. Uh, and this has been true often when we have faced these kinds of new and different challenges, and when we have uh, faced nations that seem on the rise and on the march. George Kennan, the great American statesman and, and writer, used to write routinely about how he thought the United States would never be able to withstand the Soviet challenge because we were weak and fickle and we changed our minds and they were long-seeing and they were, they were far-sighted and they were strategic. We were tactical and stupid. Somehow it worked out all right. I think there is a tendency now to think the same of China, that they have this incredible long-term vision and we're bumbling idiots. Uh, there's a wonderful story that encapsulates this. Chow and Lai is supposed to have said, I think actually uh, in a conversation with Henry Kissinger, when, when asked, what do you think of the French Revolution? He said, it's too soon to tell. And everyone thought, oh my goodness, this is so, such a, so, a, a genius. He thinks so long in centuries. Well, it turns out we now know he meant in 1973 the French Revolution of 1968, the student revolution, and it was perfectly rational to say at that point it was too soon to tell. 
So don't, don't believe that, you know, the Chinese are, are, are these strategic masterminds and we're, we're bumbling. We have managed to bumble our way through a, a rather advanced position despite the challenges from the, from the Kaiser's Germany, from the Soviet Union, from Nazi Germany, from Japan. What you will find is that the United States and North America are creating an, an extraordinary new model in this new world. We are becoming the first universal nation, a country that draws people from all parts of the world, of all colors, creeds, and religions, and finds a way to harness their talent and build a kind of universal dream. And it happens over here. It happens here and it draws together people from all over the world. Look at this panel. Three of the people on this panel, Neil Ferguson, myself, and Henry Kissinger, are immigrants who've come and found their fortune in the United States because it welcomed the most talented people in the world and allowed them to, to, to uh, flourish in whatever they, wa they want, even to denounce the United States, as Neil Ferguson is now doing. <laughs> so I simply urge you to think about this. If we lose faith in ourselves, if we lose faith in the power of free and open societies, we do much more damage than anything else we could do. We, we need to fix our economy. We need to fix all these things we can do. The Congressional Budget Office used to predict that we were going to pay off our debt uh, in 15 years, 10 years uh, ago. Now they predict that we're going to be uh, immiserated. We'll see how it works. My point to you is don't lose faith in free and open societies. Vote with your heart. Neil, your final closing remarks, please. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard tonight that China is likely to repeat the experience of other Asian countries and run out of steam, maybe. But thus far, it, of course, has done far better than these other Asian countries. China has achieved the biggest and fastest industrial revolution of them all, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. I don't agree with David. I think this story isn't half over. Maybe it's a quarter over. There's a lot more still to come. The second point I want to make to you is that the West's problems are far more serious than you have just heard from Farid. And one of the biggest problems is that kind of complacency. You know, as we speak tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the Eurozone is falling apart. An experiment with a single currency is disintegrating, mainly because of the insolvency of the cradle of democracy, Greece. As we talk, <laughs> as we talk, the public finances of the United States are, if you do the math, which I do, more or less in the same situation as Greece was two years ago. The trajectory of the debt is not different. It may only be a matter of time before a fiscal crisis strikes the United States, the magnitude of which we will never have seen before. You know what? If we'd had this debate 100 years ago, just think, and the motion had been that the 20th century would belong to the United States, who would have voted for it? It would have seemed, certainly to any British debater, preposterous. <laughs> Those Yanks, with their trivially small military forces? Yeah, they had a big economy, but look at all the social problems. Look at their cities with the squalor and poverty. It would have been very easy to make the case in 1911 that America would falter as we've, as we've heard China will falter. And yet it happened. It happened. First the economic power, then the geopolitical power. I want to conclude with a quotation. What if China gradually expands its economic ties, acts calmly and moderately, and slowly enlarges its sphere of influence, seeking only greater weight, friendship, and influence in the world? What if it quietly positions itself as the alternative to a hectoring and arrogant America? How will America cope? This is a new challenge for the United States, one for which it is largely unprepared. The words of Fareed Zakaria, ladies and gentlemen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is precisely why China will own the 21st century. And you should vote for this motion. Thank you. The great performer.
All I can say is I'm glad I do not have a second ballot, a second vote, because it was an exceedingly hard-fought and well-contested debate. And uh, let me reiterate something that Peter Monk has said at past Monk debates. You know, it's one thing for any one of these individuals to get up on a stage in front of an audience like this and give a set-piece speech. It's something quite different, though, I think, to, to have this sparring, this meeting of minds, uh, and to do it with the eloquence and conviction that our debaters have done so tonight. So please, a big round of applause for our debaters. Bravo, bravo, bravo. That's good, wow. Bravo, bravo, gentlemen. Bravo. Well done. Well, one final comment, uh, Dr. Kissinger, I think you have denied your public some very special talents that you've had in waiting to your 88th year to engage in a public debate. You were absolutely outstanding tonight, sir. Thank you. Now, before we vote for a second time, let's briefly review where public opinion was uh, at in this room at the start of tonight's debate. We had asked you, yes, no, and maybe. There are the numbers, 39, 21, 40. We then asked, depending on what you heard, you've heard a lot this evening, some very convincing and compelling arguments on both sides. Sides, would you change your mind? 96% yes, possibly changing their vote. So this debate is very much in play. You all have a ballot with your program. Our ushers will collect them on the way out. I will announce the results in the south lobby shortly after 9.15 p.m. in the free public reception. And for all of you watching online uh, at theglobeandmail.com and monkdebates.com, the results will be on our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and our website in a matter of the next half hour. So again, ladies and gentlemen, to the reception, let's start voting. What? They're going to do it right now with a paper ballot. So we announce it uh, in 15 minutes in the reception. All of them have a paper ballot in their program.